In a sense, one might describe the air war in Ukraine as a fundamentally attritional struggle, albeit one defined by constant adaptation and counter-adaptation. The chaos and Russian deep strikes of the opening weeks quickly gave way to a conflict more defined by standoff engagements and mutual air denial. We've seen the Russian VKS increasingly turn towards long-range munitions like glide bombs, while Ukraine has sought to leverage a wide range of technologies including Western air launch cruise missiles, long-range kamikaze drones, and the sometimes very aggressive use of Western SAM systems like Patriot to offset to some extent their disadvantage in airframes. Now, as the war enters its third year, the Ukrainian Air Force probably finds itself at something of a low ebb, with pilots and maintenance crews presumably having to be pulled off the line to prepare for the conversion over to F-16, while the near-complete breakdown of US aid has left much of the Ukrainian military on a starvation diet when it comes to critically needed munitions, while the VKS has to push to maintain its operational tempo, despite losses, and potential sustainability issues. And so today, I really want to zoom in on where the air war stands as of February 2024. Doing that probably means asking first what the major changes in the air war have been from 2022 until now, assessing the impact of some of the key systems and tactics we've seen deployed, everything from Russia's glide bombs and Ukraine's very nomadic Patriot systems, through to issues like the what and why of friendly fire aircraft shootdowns, and the apparently reignited interest in potentially supplying Ukraine with American A-10 attack planes. Then, given the attritional nature of the struggle, I want to zoom in on some potential pinch points and where some of the limitations might be in terms of things like munition or airframe availability. Before zooming out and looking at the broader picture, asking what the impact of the air war might be on Russia, Ukraine, and their various allies. To answer those questions, today I'm fortunate to be joined by Professor Justin Bronk. Justin is the Senior Research Fellow for Air Power and Technology at the Royal United Services Institute, holds a professor position at the Royal Norwegian Air Force Academy, and was an author of a November 2022 report which stands as one of the more detailed publicly released reports on the air war in Ukraine. Of course, November 2022 is a long time and about a thousand Taylor Swift releases from February 2024. And so, after a brief welcome, the first question I wanted to ask was how has the air war changed between then and now? All right, Justin, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. So my question to you is essentially, back in November 2022, you and your colleagues at Rusi's published uh, a report on the air war in Ukraine. And at that time, we were sort of transitioning from that somewhat chaotic February-March phase to one that was more dominated by long-range engagements. How then do you assess the air war's evolution over the course of 2023? And what are some of the prominent features of the current campaign? So the the course of the air war through 2023, uh, I think, is one of cautious adaptation by both sides, uh, but largely uh, denial of effective ability to operate um, fixed wing in most areas of the front. And therefore, the kind of strategically important parts of the air war uh, were essentially attack aviation on in a defensive sense for the Russians, which had a really significant impact on Ukrainian breakthrough attempts in the counteroffensive. offensive and the, the strategic long-range uh, aviation campaign, um, so both uh, Tupolev 95, T-160s, uh, T-22M3s, uh, so the bombers, plus uh, MiG-31Ks launching uh, Kinshal, um ballistic missiles, uh, coupled with ground-based launches, some some cruise missile att- attacks uh, continuing from the Black Sea, although increasingly Ukraine contesting the, the surface vessels um, ability to operate sustainably there uh, in certain bits. Um, and then, of course, the, the continued use at scale of the Shahed 136 uh, as a sort of cheap long-range uh, bombardment munition, both to hit smaller targets and also to um, complicate the task of air defense. As a result of that long-range campaign uh, and Ukrainians starting to play with, um, first of all, uh, using Western long-range cruise missiles, particularly UK and French-supplied Storm Shadow and, and Scalp. Uh, and then le- later in 2023, starting to use uh, a range of uh, relatively low-tech, um, relatively cheap, although again, that's still relatively, um, long-range one-way attack UAVs against targets in Russia, including air bases, as well as more symbolic things like Moscow. Um, and as a result of... of those kind of evolutions in the long-range strike scale, a lot of effort when has been going in on both sides to improving air defence capability from ground-based air defences, which of course further um, complicates matters for piloted aviation near the front lines um, if those 
uh, air defenses are, are being improved near the front lines. Russia already had very strong ground-based air defenses, and in fact, in, in some ways, it's actually gone the opposite way for them because they've had to distribute somewhat more of that capability that they have away from the front to try and protect their bases and, and reinforce defenses around Moscow and other, other cities. But for the Ukrainians, it's been a case of transitioning steadily from um, you know really heavy de heavy dependence on S three hundred PSPT and, and uh, S three hundred V ones uh, towards uh, more and more reliance on Patriot and, and Sabti, uh, the French Sabti, uh coming in towards the back end, and then <coughs> at the sort of tactical level, uh, increasingly supplementing uh, SA eleven and SA eight SA eight Vulcanosa with. NASAMs and uh, IRIS-T, uh, as well as a, a range of kind of Frank and Sam so-called type of assets. What that's meant is that throughout 2023, uh, and certainly into the beginning of 2024, Russia has actually found its own ability to push sorties up to the front lines on their own side, increasingly contested by that improving Ukrainian air defense on the ground even as the Ukrainian Air Force has continued to take losses and uh, along with having to take pilots out of frontline service to uh, try and put them into transition programs for F-16, for example, you've seen a, a sort of diminution of the Ukrainian ability to fly effective sorties anywhere near the front lines, but equally the Russians as well. So there's a couple of elements to unpack there. Uh, GBAD sustainability, F-16 entering the field. Um, but one element I think I want to jump into first, which I think couples with your comment about both the Ukrainian counteroffensive and the difficulty of Russia pushing sorties up to that forward edge of the battle area, which is the use of more standoff munitions, particularly the VKS employing larger number of glide bombs, both against the counteroffensive and most recently and quite famously at Avdivka, which was being hit very, very heavily. And we got the footage of that. I was wondering what comments you could make or observations you could make about those glide bomb attacks, their scale, the method of use, their uh, scaling and sustainability. So one of the, the key responses from uh, the Russian fixed wing uh, fast jet uh, fleet to that inability and uh, not only to cross the Ukrainian front lines and operate, uh, which became clear very early in the war, um, but also increasingly being contested even for their sort of standoff um, laser or TV guided uh, weapon attacks with things like KH-29 um, throughout 23 has been an increase, increasingly to rely on standoff um, glide bomb attacks. This is both with um, dedicated glide bombs that are designed as such, as well as increasingly heavy use of essentially wing glide wing kits for um, more traditional and much more plentiful uh, 500 and 1,500 kilogram bombs. These two weapons are not um, hugely accurate insofar as um, while the, the kind of purpose-built um, cab series uh, weapons can typically hit buildings fairly accurately, they're, they're still, you know, you're talking about hitting large buildings uh, as part of a, a salvo usually. Whereas for the, the kind of a glide kit adaptation um, versions, you're talking slightly less reliable at hitting buildings. But it's it's... It's a weapons, uh, so a series of weapons that they can use at relatively large scale that can provide a means of really quite heavy bombardment, even compared to artillery ammunition, because, you know, a 500 kilogram bomb is, is a really substantial warhead um, or, or payload, and a 1,500 kilogram bomb is, is enormous. Um, so in that sense, you know, the, they, they have heavy firepower, which they can draw on, um, and they... Uh, can lo log from really fairly significant distances, albeit, as we've seen from a, a series of Ukrainian Patriot engagements, they are still at risk. Um, so it's not free from risk. Um, and the further out that they log these, these munitions from, um, the higher they have to go and the faster they have to go. So the longer they have to spend at the very high um, altitude in full afterburner, um, leaving themselves potentially open to uh, ambushes if there is a, a SAM in the right place at the right time, which is a big if. Uh, so there's a bit of a kind of trade-off. Uh, initially, when they started using the glide bombs, they were coming in fairly close, 20, 20 kilometers, 30 kilometers from the front. 
As the Ukrainians have gotten better at periodically engaging them with with Patriot, um, which of course they can't do all the time because they're they're having to uh, balance the risk of putting a launcher fairly close to the front lines with the radar further back, and also trading off that Patriot launcher, then not providing defensive capacity in a in a around the Ukrainian city. Um, but as they've got better at conducting these engagements, you've seen the Russians pull further and further back. Um, and now, you know, sometimes seeing launches as far as, you know, 50 kilometers or even slightly more, which is a very long way for a glide bomb. Uh, and at those kind of ranges, the, the accuracy does tail off. There is a uh, GLONASS, um, so the Russian equivalent of GPS, uh, GLONASS um, guidance on, on, the, on the tail kits. But um, with the, the sort of errors that creep in with the amount, particularly the amount of electronic warfare there is uh, around the field, the further out you push those weapons, the, the more will will fail to meet the to get to the target, and also you see you do see a bit of a diminution of accuracy. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's another form of firepower for the Russians, and they've they've used it very heavily around Avdivka against Kharkiv. Um, but, I mean, they're using them around the front uh, in in large numbers, but it's not necessarily a kind of uh, capability which fundamentally changes what the Russians can and can't hit in the sense that they can't go after um, dynamic targets with these things. So they, they can't find and, and hit things that are moving. Uh, in that sense, something like Lancet 3, the, the, the sort of large ammunition they use a lot, is, is far more um, substantial in terms of the impact it's had on how the Ukrainians have to fight. It's just another really heavy form of fire, how they can bring down alongside all the artillery and rocket artillery. Um, but it gives the VKS fighter fleet a continued purpose in terms of actually trying to influence the battlefield. And where you have Ukrainian positions that are particularly exposed, as as in Avdivka until you know just before the withdrawal, there you can see that actually it can be used as a really heavy um, kind of consistent form of bombardment um, because it, it's a pocket essentially, and therefore. Um, a, it's easier to know what you're aiming at, the targets don't move, and B, um, that you can get settled into flight patterns and sortie generation and the mission planning is much easier and the targeting is much easier So, in terms of, of getting weapon coordinates. So you see where there is a particularly <clears throat> isolated Ukrainian position or an area of really heavy fighting, um, you, you see the VKS actually generating really quite significant sortie rates with these light bomb attacks. I think one interesting element you touched on there is the interaction between those attacks and Ukraine attempting to fend these off using those ambush uh, strikes using presumably Patriot and Pac-2, I think is the, the prime suspect for those ambush attacks. Obviously, this is not a conflict which is an alien alien to the concept of longer range SAMs. I believe back in 2022, you were commenting on the risk posed by the S-400 comboed with um, the 48YA-6 for detecting at all altitude. Um, so my question then is, this is, seems like a bit of a departure from the use of Patriot by Western militaries, largely in the static defense role that we have seen up to this point. Are there any observations or lessons we might want to make about the use of a longer ranged, almost strategic range SAM in this way? It certainly, the, the sort of SAM ambushes with Patriot certainly is a departure from the way that the West has, has, has used Patriot um, pretty much for its entire service life. Uh, and it's you, you see that in, for example, the fact that the the, the more modern Pac-3 um, uh, missiles, uh, the MSE, Pac-3 MSE types, are significantly less well optimized for that kind of task. Um, they are you can have more of them in a launcher. They're more capable in a ballistic missile and a, and a cruise missile defense role than Pac-2, but they are lighter and they don't have as much booster in terms of they don't carry as much boost but fuel. So actually, in terms of really long-range engagements against aircraft, they're not ideal. Um, and also the fact that just the warhead is smaller because it's a smaller, smaller, more efficient missile that uh, aims to do a kind of hit-to-kill uh, type engagement. Uh, so it's interesting that a lot of these engagements are likely to be packed too, um, which speaks to exactly to your point that the Patriot is being used in a way that is kind of quite old school. <laughs> By 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 Western ground-based uh, air and missile defense uh, evolution terms. So, in that sense, yes, it's it's a bit different. Equally, the Ukrainians have been using Patriot extensively in the role for which the West has kind of um, optimized it over the last twenty years. 
because Ukrainian cities continue to be under um, fairly intensive cruise missile and ballistic missile attack, and it's performed extremely well there, including against the, the Kinjal. Well, these kind of SAM ambushes, I think one of the key elements that's likely to be in play is that uh, some of the Patriot systems that have been delivered are on self-propelled um, sort of truck chassis. So they do have a, a greater degree of mobility than the standard American uh, trailer mounted systems. Also that uh, Patriot networked in such a way that you can have the launcher quite a long distance from the radar. And so in terms of conducting SAM ambushes, the, the only thing that a that a, a fighter crew or a helicopter crew uh, on the Russian side would see is that there is a Patriot radar in roughly that direction. But of course, given that the Patriot radars uh, have very, very long range, and the Russians are typically operating at medium to high altitude when they're reasonably far back from the lines and think they're safe, they're likely to see a Patriot radar quite regularly, not just when there's a SAM ambush being planned. So... From their perspective, the, the the threat picture doesn't necessarily change a whole lot, which is it, it is good for the Ukrainians because it means that the Russians have to potentially treat it as though any time they see a Patriot radar spike uh, on their radar warning receivers, that they're potentially um, in range of an engagement, even though the radar is really quite far back. Um, and because they can use uh, track wire missile, has an engagement mode, which the S-400 can do as well with some of its missiles. Um, if the aircraft subsequently, for example, was go to low level, um, but the missile itself is able to see um, the, the aircraft when it's in active mode getting relatively close, uh, not only should the missile be able to, to home in, but if it still has kind of line of sight, um, radio line of sight in terms of a data link to the, the launching battery, uh, then it can take advantage of the the um, much greater computing power for for guidance adjustment um, in real time that the ground based system has compared to what can be carried inside the missile in flight. Um, so it's it's quite a nasty system for pilots to to be engaged by. It doesn't give you a whole lot of warning that you've been engaged, and the position of the radar can be really quite a long way from the launcher, which makes uh, judging your um, uh, the, the missile engagement zone, essentially, of the system based on in-cockpit uh, signals very difficult. It should be said, the Russians can do this too, uh, in the sense that the S-400 and S-300 systems, uh, the more modern ones anyway, um, can have a reasonable spread between the, the various radars and the launchers, um, albeit it tends to be a little bit closer together, um, and either because it either relies on a microlink, uh, so a sort of microwave frequency link, which the range is about two kilometers for that, uh, and you need line of sight, or you're relying on field cables, in which case there tend to be at pre-sighted locations where those field cables have been dug. Um, so the Russians can split these things too, but it's, it's a bit less flexible than the way Patriot does it. Well, then I think those Russian systems are a good pivot because in many ways they may represent the second greatest reported threat to VKS aircraft operating in Ukraine at times. Um, and this is, this is, of course, the question of friendly fire, particularly on the Russian side, uh, because often the defence we've seen stated by the Russian Ministry of Defence is when Ukraine claims a Patriot shoot down, often the rebuttal, if an aircraft is admitted loss, is that it was lost due to friendly fire. My question is, in terms of what we can assess externally, to what extent has friendly fire been a problem for the VKS, and do we have any indication why deconfliction and, and their um, friend or foe identification may not have prevented those incidents? Um, so friendly fire has been a consistent problem for the VKS. It's also been a consistent problem for the Ukrainian Air Force. Um, and that is the case for both fixed wing um, so, and, and rotary conventional aircraft. It's also the case for UAVs. Um, so the last time I was in Ukraine, the, the, the Ukrainian UAV uh, operators reckoned that more than half of the UAVs that they lose are due to friendly fire in terms of uh, both you know, people shooting at them, uh, but also um, particularly electronic warfare. Uh, I think the, the, there's a couple of components to why friendly fire on the Russian side with aircraft um, seems to be a consistent problem, uh, and one that we know for sure was friendly fire. They lost a, they, they shot down one of their own Super 35s near Topmark um, about four or five months ago now. Um, and, you know, the, the, the aircraft was not hugely close to the front lines, 
um, you know, was was well on the Russian side. Um, and, you know, you think, well, given how rigidly the Russians do their mission planning and their in-flight control as to the Ukrainians, this is, this is the, you know, still an adaptation of the old Soviet model of how to use air power. So sorties are very rigidly planned and they are executed extremely rigidly um, so that, you know, for example, weapons release decisions need authorization in real time from a controller. Um, you know, a lot, and even things like how you set the radar, uh, what, what you're doing with the radar is is often you know interfacing and being told what to do by the by the controllers. It's a very alien way um, for for Western air power um, speakers because that's not how we do um, in cockpit process. You would expect that that degree of pre planning and that rigidity and centralized control of air operations would really help with deconfliction because pilots aren't necessarily doing things that are unexpected and aren't part of the plan. Having said that, the the Russian system is quite slow at transferring information between different bits of the system. So if a plan does have to change, let's say an aircraft gets engaged and has to go defensive uh, and therefore is doing things that it, it is not intended to do, it may be slower under the Russian system than it would be um, in a Western air you know, combined air, composite air operation, for example, to you know be able to share data on on where that aircraft now is and what it's doing. Equally, the the impact of electronic warfare is is likely to be quite significant, in the sense that you're both having regular degradation uh, for both sides of the radar picture. So systems are potentially for, um, taking longer to get locks. Getting locks that are less um, less high fidelity in terms of they're not getting good bearing data. It's good, good range data um, because of both potentially friendly and hostile electronic warfare. I mean, one of the consistent things is that Russian electronic warfare is highly effective, but it's not well um, it's not well integrated in, in the sense that the systems don't play well with other Russian systems. Um, so if they're using heavy electronic warfare in order to try and do something in the same area of operations that a fixed wing sortie is going on uh, on their own side, then it may be that that creates sufficient ambiguity in what the SAM operators are seeing and what where the pilot thinks they are, um, that you can get these engagements. Uh, equally, I think for the most part, Russian claims uh, of friendly fire as an attribution for losses um, are likely to be mostly trying to avoid crediting the Ukrainians with shooting down key assets. I mean, certainly the the, the attempt to attribute the loss of the A-50 um, AWACS uh, a month ago... That seemed like to, a strange mistake for air defence to make. Yeah, right. Like it, as, a, as a mistake to make in terms of shooting something on your own side down with air defences, the AWACS is about the most surprising and difficult to understand because not only is it a system that is so far back from the front lines over what was assumed to be a very safe orbit um, in, you know, it, I mean, it's over the sea inside, um, you know, well behind the front lines, about 100 kilometers um, plus from the front lines. No Ukrainian fixed wing aircraft is going to be there. There's no way they could get an aircraft there. Um, and the error in terms of sensor data and sensor calibration that you would have to have in order to think that that aircraft was anywhere near the front lines is, is too far for my mind to be credible. Also, the AWACS is a, a key integration node for ground-based air defences and air operations, particularly in the Russian system where, where the operations of both are tightly controlled. One of the key um, C2 nodes, command and control nodes, is the A50. Uh, as well as the Aleutian 22, um, which was also uh, fragged. Uh, they, they managed to land, but with a lot of uh, new holes in the tail. Um, so the idea that you would have an engagement of these two key C2 assets that are way, way behind the front lines in a place that no Ukrainian fixed-wing aircraft could possibly be by long-range Russian air defences is, is not credible to me. And equally, we've seen consistently the Ukrainians managing to achieve um, these these SAM ambushes with Patriot from longer ranges. And we know that some of them are definitely Patriot because we've seen 
um, Ukrainian um, footage of Patriot launchers, which are all radar vehicles, which have particular engagement dates and silhouettes on them that correspond with some of those those shoot downs. Um, so yeah, it, a lot of it I think is just Russians trying to uh, avoid crediting the Ukrainians. Um, they prefer to be accused by the people of by their own people of gross incompetence rather than credit Ukrainians with with those sort of engagements. Now, before we move on from equipment and tactics, there's one other discussion point we had a little bit later that I think actually belongs here. And it's the only time this interview that I'm going to distort the flow of time, because it has to do with what I would regard as one of the main potential risks when it comes to Ukraine requesting and receiving new equipment and support in 2024. With Ukraine, it's often the case that when you see debates about whether or not a particular piece of equipment should go, the discussion probably really should go beyond whether or not a piece of equipment would be useful or not but also how much space it would take up in the limited aid budgets that are being voted and authorised. Sending Ukraine something that is near the end of its service life and the military may throw away might still end up counting against the available aid budget, plus money has to be allocated for transportation, training, sustainment and support. And so in an environment where aid is constrained and the share of aid that can be dedicated towards the air war is perhaps even more constrained, it's always interesting to see the occasional bright idea make the appearance. And recently, for example, Ukrainian military leadership once again floated the idea that perhaps the American A-10 might be a useful addition to Ukraine's inventory. Given that the Sukhoi-25 fleets in Ukraine have mostly been limited to pitch-up attacks using unguided rockets, and the fact that there would inevitably be costs in converting Ukrainian air crews and ground crews over to the A-10 platform, I couldn't resist the chance to insert just a little bit of levity by asking Justin what he thought of sending Ukraine what might be one of the most polarizing aircraft in US inventory. Let's just say US aid was passed tomorrow and you were given the credit card for the full amount. Why are you not spending any of it on artillery ammunition or your joint air-to-surface standoff missiles, your JASMs, and instead spending the entire amount on A-10 Thunderbolts? Oh, good old A-10. Um, I mean, all I would say on A-10 is um, it's built to take hits and get the pilot home alive. Um, it's not built to take hits and fight another day. So even A-10s that have taken man pads, so shoulder fired man pads with quite small warhead hits that have got their crews home successfully, you know, despite incredible damage. It's an amazingly resilient airframe. Um, you know, most of those never flown again. Um, so the idea that because it's a tough aeroplane that it could survive in, in Ukrainian airspace, uh, near the front lines, let alone be effective, um, with those level of, of, you know, that, that, that level of surface to missile coverage with you know, mostly quite big SAMs, um, but even an A-10 is not going to survive being hit by, um, and of course the air to air threat against which is completely helpless. Um, you know, the effectiveness of the A-10 as a close air support platform in almost all the wars that it's actually fought in has very little to do with the gun. Um, except in extremely niche scenarios where you really need danger close fires, at which point, yep, sure, it's better than anything else. But, you know, the vast majority of A-10 close air support is conducted with precision munitions, so JDAMs, paveways, um, other things, which, uh, uh, Mavericks, which it fires for medium level with targeting pod um, designation. You just can't do that in Ukraine. Um, the, the, the medium level environment is so lethal from surface to missile coverage, you would be down very, very low, um, just as Ukrainians are, whether you're flying a Su-25 or an A-10, and the resource required to put it in, um, you know, in terms of pilot maintenance training, airbase preparation, support contracts, everything, would be, you know, in many ways comparable to F-16, even though it's a cheaper aircraft to fly, um, for significantly less in terms of actual output. One of my favorite memes on the internet is the, um, that classic one of the uh, you know the the bloke getting his gold medal and kind of kissing the the girl who's given it to him and then biting the gold medal and putting his fingers up at everybody and you know, showering champagne at himself and then you zoom out and he's at the very lowest rung of the podium and there's a version of that which is close air support in uh, Desert Storm and you've got you know F one eleven F sixteen yeah. tornado all the ones down and then A ten at the bottom and A ten's the guy doing that it's um it's a wonderful close air support platform but um, I think a bit over fetishized. I'm Australian. I'm forced to endorse the F-111 and its wonderful legacy. It's, it's a patriotic duty. Now, at this point in the interview, I saw an opportunity to pivot towards the stuff I know you're all really here for. 
particularly questions of industrial production, munition supply, airframe availability, and the broader sustainability of the efforts on both sides. For the Ukrainians, the inputs into their ability to sustain activity are probably fairly intuitive. How many new aircraft can they expect to receive from their allies? How many pilots and ground crews will be trained on those new platforms? And what weapon systems and support are going to come with them? But the question I wanted to put to Justin at this point was how has the Russian sortie rate evolved over the course of the fighting and how the VKS has gone about sustaining that effort? Well, on the Russian side, the, the sortie rates that they're generating are less than they were particularly during much of 20, 2022 and 23. But that said, they're not massively less. Um, and the impact on of kind of the continued rate of ops as well as losses uh, varies a lot between fleets. So, for example, you've seen a huge impact on the ability of the Russians to sustain uh, ML-52 helicopter um, sortie rates and op tempo because, apart from the else, they've lost over half the pre-war fleet and it wasn't a huge fleet to begin with. And also the, the 52s have been um, overwhelmingly the most heavily tasked of the Russian attack helicopter fleets. So there you're seeing a pretty understandable um, drop off in ability to generate sorties, although equally it's worth saying that also the requirement for them is much lower now because the Ukrainians are back on the defensive and therefore um, having them there is that kind of fire brigade to, to stop breakthroughs and, and contain them if they if they look like they might happen is, is not really there anymore. Um, so, you know, there's an impact there, whereas the 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 Havoc, the, the MI-28 and, and the older Hind uh, fleets still operating at a lower tempo, but relatively consistently um, and not doing a huge amount, mostly just lobbing rockets. Equally, you've seen the Russian sortie rates on Su-25 dropping off a bit. Um, again, it's it's a fleet that they've run pretty hard. And that even though they have a huge number of stored airframes, the, the number of uh, modernized Su-25, Su-25SM and more modernized Su-25SM-3s that they entered the war with was about 130 to 150. And so again, when you look at the loss rates there, I mean, they lost somewhere in the region of 20 to 25% of the fleet, um, along with some of their better pilots. So, you know, again, it's not surprising that you've seen diminishing sortie rates there. Same with the Su-34 uh, fullback fleet. Again, lost really significant number um, of aircraft. It's a big complex machine. They, they used it very heavily in the first two months of the war. Um, what you're seeing now is a, a greater weight of the effort being conducted um, by Su-30 and Su-35, so the, the fighters, particularly for, for glide bombs because they have the performance and they're perfectly capable of launching them. Um, to, to lob them from far away. They're more modern jets than, for example, the Su-25, Su-24s, that, that no, Su-24, mostly Russian naval aviation and Wagner, but that had been had been conducting a lot of the sorties. Uh, and the Su-34s are continuing to, to operate heavily as well. Um, it's interesting, Russian industry seems to be prioritizing the output of Su-34 replacements. Uh, you are seeing uh, continued replacement of, uh, production of Su-35 as well. Um, Su-34 is, is coming out in greater numbers, uh, and the, the Su-30 is less so, despite significant losses, mostly on the ground for, for, for Su-30. Um, but yeah, the, 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 I think the bigger bottleneck is likely to be perception of need to funnel resource rather than anything particularly um, problematic in a technical or logistical sense. There were concerns for uh, well, hopes in our, on, the, on the, the Western side for a while that the, the Russians having run their and fleets for so long uh, at such a higher tempo than they are designed, they were designed and resourced to be run in peacetime, would mean that, for example, they'd suddenly go off a cliff in terms of engine availability because they'd all hit their engine design life um, uh, hours or, or at least the uh, hours at which they need to be taken out of the aircraft and sent back to the factory for a full overhaul. And ultimately, the, the, the issue with those sort of um, predictions, you know, just as predictions early on in the war in, in sort of March 22, that because some of the Russian tires were failing, that that meant that the whole system was about to fall over. Um, the Russians are pretty good at fixing these problems. Um, and a lot of it's just a case of accepting technical risk at a level that we wouldn't in the West. 
And one thing you have seen, um, which I, to my mind at least, increases the, the credibility of the, the assumption that they are essentially just ignoring a lot of those more problematic pinch points uh, that would be problematic for us in terms of manual mandatory inspection intervals and things for, for engines and, and airframes, is that you have seen an uptick in Russian crashes um, from presumably technical failures um, in the, the past year, which suggests to me that they are pushing past where their maintenance um, manuals and, and where their design specifications say that things ought to be taken out of service for a while, whether it's engines or aircraft and, and thoroughly overhauled. They're just going on with it. Now that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is, is done um, and has been unfortunately very successfully contained by the Russians, uh, and the Russians are back on the offensive themselves, I think it's likely that the Russians are taking a bit more of a pause, but also just not prioritizing really getting everything they could they can out of the tactical aviation fleets because they don't need to. Um the the the, the effectiveness that they have in terms of changing the situation on the ground is relatively limited. Um the glide bombs are uh, you know, a nightmare for those who are in a position that is repeatedly under attack by them, but they're not going to swing the wall one way or the other. Um, and with the increasing Patriot engagements, or at least the steady pace of those Patriot engagements, um, you know, there's, there's probably a bit of a change risk 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 um, result trade off for the Russians. So yeah, a bit of a decline in in ops tempo on the tactical uh, as fleet side of things, but. I don't think it's because they have any particular logistics bottlenecks. Equally, you're still seeing the strategic aviation in terms of long-range aviation group um, operating at a very high tempo. Um, it's kind of impressive, annoyingly, that with these, particularly the, the ancient the U-95s, um, the, 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 the long-range aviation group has consistently been able to um, meet these uh, mission plans for really large groups of bombers in the air at once from what is a relatively small fleet, uh, consistently launch these large salvos of cruise missiles and also maintain their usual, or most of their usual deterrence training. So because these are nuclear assets as well. Um, and some of the sort of long range signaling flights, which given how old these assets are, uh, is, is sort of undeniably slightly impressive. Uh, equally, they are constrained in terms of missile production and other things. So it's not it's not that they, they, they're probably fairly close to the limits of what they can consistently do in the long range aviation department, but it's not, um, it's not really having strategic effect. And I don't think it's going to go off a cliff anytime soon in terms of that limit. Well, you've started to touch on that point of the, the depth of the Russian bench, so to speak, their ability to substitute, even if the preferred airframe might not be available. Where else can airframes be pulled for? Or what other airframe can be used? I remember back in Syria, if a PGM was being used by the Russians, it was likely a Sukhoi 34 dropping it or deploying it, whereas now a larger number of airframes are being used to deploy those glide bombs. So if we have long-range aviation where potentially you could scale down deterrence patrols if you needed to pull airframes for Ukraine urgently. In the case of the glide bombing attacks, you can substitute to some extent Sukhoi 30 or 35 for 34. Are there any points where that ability to substitute is more limited than others? I'm thinking potentially of key enablers like the A50s or perhaps the MiG-31s, which were not blessed with a tremendous service life. And I remember being very important uh, in the cap role early in the war. Yeah, so kind of key pinch points, I think, would be firstly the availability of MiG thirty one K, because the the Russians are producing more um, Kinjal um, ballistic missiles than they can fire easily at once, and also they're aware that in order to get them through where there's Patriot cover, they need multiple, uh, they need big salvos ideally, and. Because one of the limitations on that is the number of MiG-31Ks that they can get in the air at any point, which is typically around six. Um, they are working to and have already made some progress on getting Kinjal incorporated on other aircraft, on other airframes. So various Ukrainian reports that they've been firing them from Su-34. I'd be interested to see the uh, integration there because that's a big missile for the Su-34 to be carrying. I know the Su-34 is a big airplane, but um, it's not MiG-31. 
Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I would guess if it's if it's under the intake trunk, if it's between the intake trunks, that the clearance on the the, the front gear would be interesting. Um, but certainly, there've been reports that, that the the Russians also working to integrate uh, Kinjal on the TU twenty two and three, so the the backfires, um, which have consistently been um, lobbing these not particularly accurate but extremely powerful and therefore regularly cause these horrible civilian casualty incidents, the KH twenty two um, anti ship missiles, um, which are themselves enormous and ballistic, quasi ballistic in nature. Um, and they can carry three of them, or typically they'd carry two. Uh, so you, seeing the Russians putting resource into integrating Kinjal on them so that they can increase the number of, of Kinjals they can get in the air simultaneously and thereby have more effective salvos. Um, the, the employment of more PGMs uh, from Su-35 in particular uh, is, I think, less to do with Overcoming the core limitations of Russian cockpit design and PGM design, which which is which are the reasons why they they really focused on the Su thirty four and to a slightly lesser extent the Su thirty, um, both two seaters, um, for using PGMs in in Syria um, it, because just it's too much cockpit workload without a targeting pod using their slightly clunky weapons and and much less advanced um, kind of interfaces for compared to Western jets. They, they need that extra capacity to to work those weapons effectively. What you're seeing with the glide bombs um, is a much simpler uh, kind of PGM employment. It's not conducting TV guided or laser guided weapon attacks where when the Russians have been doing those, they're still using the Su-34 for the overwhelming majority of attacks and occasionally Su-30SM. Uh, instead, with a, with a GLONASS or GPS guided bomb, you basically just fly it into the launch acceptable region and, and release it. Uh, and so for that, yeah, it's, it's, it makes sense that they've been um, heavily employing the, the Su-35 and, and the Su-30s to take pressure off the 34s. So there's a fair degree of adaptation. Um, but also, you know, it's worth remembering that strategic bombardment, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about um, Kinjals and cruise missiles and, uh, you know, even to a degree, light bombs, although that's more tactical bombardment it, it's it's a um, force multiplier for other effects it creates friction and cost and forces your opponent to um distribute things in an inefficient way and have to have redundancy and you know every so often things are hit that are, that are difficult to replace but it, there is almost no examples in history of that kind of thing in a conventional sense anyway and is different having a decisive effect and I think the Russians do understand that. So the amount of extra resource they're pumping into the air environment at the moment is significantly less. Uh, and you can see it in the, the prioritization of resource than the enormous resources that the Russians are pumping into improving their um, ground forces training capacity near the front lines. Um, so, well, on the Russian side of the lines, but you know, these sort of training regiments that they've now managed to get enough breathing space to set up. Um, to to provide basic training to recruits as they come through from each wave of mobilization. Obviously, huge resource being poured into production of artillery ammunition, um, artillery barrels, and also increasingly um, MLRS ammunition, as so multiple launch rocket systems, um, partly because uh, rocket artillery systems don't rely on barrels, um, and barrels wear out almost as fast as munition stocks of, in normal artillery. So, you know, the, the, if you're looking at where the Russians are really putting priority in terms of resource, it's that continued ability to grind forward with you know, lots of armor and huge amounts of artillery and troops that are not well trained, but they're much better trained than they were in the kind of heady days of the, 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 the you know, spring last year and, and particularly the, the Ukrainian counteroffensive in, in October and November 22. Uh, where the Russians really were just throwing bodies into trenches um, straight from being plucked off the street pretty much, maybe a week or two straining. Um, the force quality is much closer now. Um, the Russians are much more consistent in their training, um, which is one of the reasons why things are going worse, but of course the main one being ammunition shortages. On that note, at that point in the interview, I then wanted to pivot the discussion towards potential pinch points in the supply of munitions, specifically air-launch munitions. And so having discussed cruise missiles and glide bombs in the past, 
At this point, I instead pose the question, have we seen any significant change in the rate of Russian consumption of various air-to-air munitions, particularly things like the R-37? Yeah, so the, the, the R-37 um, firing rate is much lower uh, on the Russian side, although that's mostly because the Ukrainians are just flying a lot less. A lot of the requirements are, there. Are, are, are off uh, and, and maintenance crews are, are, are in the West doing conversion training. So that means the Russians have far fewer aerial targets to shoot at. Um, the other thing is with R-37, you know, the production rate is actually pretty high um, in the sense that they were never particularly concerned with ammunition consumption rates, uh, at least from what I could see in terms of Russian discussion. Um, and certainly the continued efforts to incorporate them in more platforms Increase the number of Su 35s that could fire them with the, the spiral sort of software updates that they, they did for that, um, away from the core MiG 31 platform um, for which the weapon was designed. Um, work to integrate them potentially on the Su 30 SM2 that has a data link that means it's, it's potentially worth um, using that missile. Um, the, the earlier SM can't support the, the weapon far enough. It, I think part of it is that it's a much easier missile to produce for the Russians than most of them because it doesn't have lots of Western components in it. Um, you know, taken apart an R thirty seven, and it uh, well, looked inside one, and it, it, you know, there's almost no Western components of any sort, because you know it's a really big missile that actually, in 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 terms of compute uh, requirements, is has a relatively simple task compared to something like a cruise missile or an anti ship missile or a ballistic missile, um, and so uh, you probably gain less by taking the cost from a design point of view of going with those lighter, better, faster Western ships in something like an R-37 than you do in smaller missiles like the R-77 um, and, and more complex ones. And in that sense, there's also, as a result, will be a lower bottlenecks in terms of the Russian ability to scale production of R-37 because they're not having to import components that require them to get around the sanctions, which they are doing and they are getting around the sanctions they're importing in many ways, in many categories, more Western ships than they were at the start of the war. But they're doing so at a massively higher cost and with less predictability about where and when shipments are coming through. So, you know, people saying, you know, the sanctions are bust, they didn't work. Well, no, no, the, the sanctions have had quite a significant effect. It's just they were never going to have a decisive effect on a country the size of Russia when a large part of the world's economies are not taking part in the sanctions anyway. But what they've done is significantly limit the expansion of Russia's production capacity of complex weapons, despite enormous resources being poured into increasing that production. The, the situation in terms of Russian production would be massively worse if the sanctions weren't in place. And equally, we could, we could have a significantly greater effect on limiting Russian production and delaying it and, and reducing its, its, its size if uh, Western countries were a bit more proactive in terms of enforcement of sanctions. There's a sort of tacit assumption in a lot of policy circles that once you've legislated and put sanctions in place, that they'll work. They they only work if if you enforce them. And enforcement is difficult uh, and time consuming and also requires politics because, for example, a lot of the companies doing smuggling of Western components are in Hong Kong. Uh, Chinese companies in Hong Kong. Well, we don't have any jurisdiction in Hong Kong. So, <laughs> yeah, Interpol can't easily go after companies there. So there's this, but, you know, for example, transshipment companies, routes that they're getting things from, and those companies that are um, selling to those shell companies in Hong Kong from the West, there are ways that, that enforcement can be played there. So, you know, sanctions could be more of a problem for Russia than they are, and they are a significant issue, um, but they're certainly not going to be the decisive on their own, um, and I don't think anyone ought to have expected them to be. My reflection on that question is that it highlights the importance of understanding that Russia's ability to scale production of different systems varies greatly. And that's apparent even if you look at the official Russian statistics, where they claim several hundred percent increases in some niche categories and much more humble increases in others. Increasing the rate at which you're reactivating old T-62 tanks or building missiles that don't use particularly many or any Western components is obviously going to be a very different proposition to something which is normally full of them. For Ukraine, however, the driver of any bottlenecks is not so much going to be sanctions, but rather what rate and what type of support are they receiving from their allies. And so we moved on to discussing potential pain points in the Ukrainian munition supply. Pinch points, I mean, obviously on the Ukrainian side. Everything? It's just about everything. Um, 
because, yeah, the the US has just stopped supplying since beginning of January. Um, and while European production is increasing, um, particularly on simpler things quite quickly in terms of artillery production, for example, uh, ammunition and to a lesser extent barrels, it's nowhere close to enough to replace the US. Um, and so, you know, there is a limit to how much Europe can do. It's quite interesting, you know, a lot of the US narratives at the moment are that, you know, Europe, well, Europe just needs to finally pay its fair share. If you look at the percentage of GDP that Europe is spending on Ukraine aid, it's massively higher than the US. And in fact, in absolute terms, it's now higher than the US. Um, you know, the, this narrative that Europe is not paying its fair share uh, on Ukraine is absolutely inaccurate at this stage. Um, the US is not even providing the majority in financial terms. But of course, it's utterly replaceable in terms of the industrial might that it has and the ability to to produce particular types of munitions at scale. So, you know, it, it is almost impossible to overstate how important it is that the US um, finds a way to to pass the, the aid supplemental through through the house. Um, you know, the the Ukrainians are losing thousands of people um, because they don't have enough ammunition. Um, this isn't, you know, this is sort of, I know, you know, it's kind of a political game in, in Washington. It's an election year, people are going across, but you know, thousands of people are dying unnecessarily because of this. And the impact that we've already seen in Avdivka, I mean, this is the start, but it takes months for any decision to have a visible effect like this. And so equally, even once they fix it, it will take a while for, um, assuming they fix it, it will take a while for that flow of ammunition to really get back into place and to the units and to stabilize the situation. And all the while that they wait, things are going to get worse and worse at an increasingly fast pace. Um, you know, holding the Russians is, it really, really does require artillery ammunition at huge scale because they have just more bodies. Um, and what happens if the Russians uh, aren't getting shelled on their way across the lines is that Ukrainian casualties skyrocket even where they do hold ground because you have a, a lot more hand-to-hand -hand combat with grenades and, you know, small arms and clubs, uh, knives, um, which... Yes, the Ukrainian soldiers are more motivated. Yes, they actually tend to hold positions, but the casualty rates go up massively if they can't shell the Russians coming across the ground. Um, and uh, also, as as mud season starts to dry up, um, the vegetation will also come up, which means the Russians will have more cover, so we'll be able to get closer. Uh, and the requirement for suppressive artillery fire will increase um, to hold the lines. And Russian vehicles will have more ability to to maneuver quickly. So you know, again, it's yeah, you know, one. It, it's not a catastrophe yet, but it could be really quite quickly um, if the U.S. policy position in Washington isn't unjammed. And I think to, to illustrate that, then, with a specific focus on the munition side of the equation, where the U.S. It's much more practical for the US to provide a certain sort of assistance than the Europeans. A lot of focus on the effort of the European states, for example, to introduce F-16 or to provide Patriot batteries. But those systems don't function without the interceptors from fire from Patriot or a munition set that actually gives the F-16 utility in what is a very dangerous battle space. To what extent is Europe actually able to equip those platforms with the supply of interceptors? To what extent is there a reliance on the US? And I think also the second elephant in the room is to what extent are people reliant on the US to give permission, even where munitions are available, say the more advanced versions of AMRAAM, to release those without US permission? The European F-16 countries that are donating aircraft and providing training um, to Ukrainian pilots and crews uh, are doing as much as they can. You know, they're just giving all the aircraft they can and, and putting a lot of effort into getting them in, uh, to a suitable condition that they can be sent uh, and to providing that training in, in Romania. Getting those aircraft, which are, you know, remember, these are modernized 1980s aircraft. Um, they're, they're not state of the art. Um, the reason they're available is the countries that have them are replacing them. Um, 
the US is the only possible source of the most of the key munitions natures and potentially upgrades in terms of components, you know, sensors or, or whatever. I saw the Ukrainians have requested to those aircraft. Sorry, say again? I saw the Ukrainians had requested new radars potentially be fitted before they go into service. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, there's, there is also just an element of the, the Ukrainian expectations on Western um, aircraft are often informed by taking essentially promotional materials or even things like Wikipedia at face value in terms of ranges, in terms of you know track performance, that kind of thing. And anybody who works in the sector knows that those those figures are not accurate in real life conditions. Those are best case, um, especially for systems that are quite old. Um, but also, the, the the reason why F sixteen is 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 highly effective and has been in in all the conflicts that the U S and its allies have used it in, is because it's part of a, a, a large scale layered composite air operation model with loads of other enabling capabilities, um, very very good communications, uh, wide range of weapon systems, but also crucially very complicated tactics that take years and years and years for formation leaders and mission leaders to learn. Um, and the Ukrainian pilots will have a hard time absorbing the, the, those sort of tactics to the degree that they can lead formations with them. And also, there's likely to be friction around um, you know, Ukrainian pilots, some of whom are very combat experienced, being told that they should do things a completely different way. Um, from what we've seen with, for example, um, you know, armor when it's been supplied in the Ukrainian Respectable Western tactics is yeah well they weren't designed for this kind of war so um, you know we know, we know how to fight um, that's not the case all the time but particularly among the more experienced troops it is and the problem is that our weapon systems aren't designed for that tactics and particularly with the F sixteen even if the U S does authorize the weapons transfers for for example later model AMRAMs to give them um, more competitive range. Uh, in the, in an air-to-air -air sense, or things like JASM, potentially the joint um, joint air launch standoff. Uh, I can't remember what the acronym stands for off the top of my head. It's terrible. Um, anyway, JASM. Um, the, the mission planning is quite complicated for those weapons, um, and it still won't have decisive strategic effect. So. Yeah, the US is critical, um, but also expectations need to be managed. The, the main benefit of providing F-16 to the Ukrainians it, for them is twofold. One, it's a, a guarantee that the Ukrainian Air Force can continue to operate and, and exist long term. But they have to transfer to work, tra transfer across the Western types from a support perspective. And B, it should significantly increase uh, pilot survivability because one of the things that will definitely be superior is the um, radar warning receiver and the sort of pass, you know, defense systems. They will give a much more accurate bearing uh, and ID and ability to be notified when certain sort of radar modes, for example, are being used against them than the really old, old school um, SPO series um, sort of Soviet RWRs that the Ukrainians are flying with. So. It will significantly improve their their survivability, but only the US can can authorize the weapon supplies and can supply the weapons to to make them potentially effective in some to some degree across wider mission sets. Um, and you know that goes for a lot of stuff. I mean, Patriot, for example, the interceptors. There is a line being set up in Germany to produce Patriot, but you know it'll take time. Um, you know the, the French are supplying Sabaty. That's that's good. Um, it's not quite patriot, but it's in a sort of vaguely similar class. Um, and for example, Germany is trying to increase production of Iris T as a complement to NASAMS, um, highly effective system, but the rounds are very expensive because they've always been produced in pretty low quantity. Um, and again, all of this, the, the key factor is time. Uh, Europe is now doing mostly the right thing. There is a lot of investment starting to go into increasing production. Um, you know, a lot of the countries that have kind of gained a reputation for feet dragging, particularly Germany, are actually supplying huge amounts of stuff to Ukraine now, and, and a lot of money as well, um, in terms of support for, for you know, P-51 
people and the economy and reconstruction and things. But they, they can't quickly replace what the US has in terms of ready production of key munitions natures. That will take time. Um, and uh, the Ukrainians don't necessarily have time. Um, time costs a huge number of lives for them. So political games in, in Washington around the next election, yeah. It's 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 very interesting to see quite how badly it's going down. Of course, with the Ukrainians, but not just in Europe, but with U.S. key allies in in the Asia Pacific as well, um, who are looking at their, you know, Washington essentially just deciding to take a vacation on Ukraine while they desperately plead for ammunition under huge under heavy attack, having made these commitments to them and going, well, okay, so do U.S. security commitments and alliances mean what? They said they meant vis China in the Indo Pacific, um, and so, for example, for the you know Republican policy hawks who argue, well, you know, we shouldn't be sending loads of aid, military aid to Ukraine because uh, we need to focus on China. What they're doing in Ukraine, the, the U.S. at the moment, is massively undercutting the entire alliance network that the U.S. relies on as a as a containment strategy and and as military alliances. Um, in, in for, for a China scenario in the Indo Pacific, because allies are watching this with just, I mean, despair, really. Now, while there was potentially a lot to unpack there regarding the impact of Ukraine on the security situation in the Asia Pacific, by this point, we were running pretty tight on time. And so, as I like to do in these interviews, for the final question, I essentially opened the mic. I said people who watch this channel are usually going to be those who follow the war in Ukraine fairly closely, be fairly invested in the outcome and be looking for something they probably won't get on their nightly news. So I asked the professor if he thought there were any issues that don't get discussed commonly enough in the public sphere, with carte blanche to dive into some of the potential risks that Ukraine and its allies face in 2024. So there's, a, there's, there's quite a few issues that I think don't necessarily get discussed enough in the public space, but um, I think one of the, the key underlying issues is that when we go over the, if we, if we go over the, the sort of cliff edge, as it were, where the, the situation actually becomes impossible to recover, um, we won't know we've gone over it when we do. Um, it will only become clear when it's far too late. So in terms of reading the dynamics of the way that the, the initiative and the, the movements back and forth on the front are going, it, it, there's a, it, it's worth bearing in mind that there is a significant lag between the policy implications and, and the, the sort of timeframes within which policy decisions to change things could have an effect. Um, by the time you're observing something fairly clearly in the, in the open source in, in public, the decisions that people then think, well, they should do this, those would have had to been done a few months back, uh, at least, in order to have changed that. Um, so the, there's a lag time, which I think people don't necessarily appreciate. And also, you know, from a, from a political side in terms of, you know, the consequences of, uh, essentially abandoning the Ukrainians in terms of not providing the support that we need and not taking this seriously enough, um, in terms of the amount that we spend, um, in Europe, as well as obviously the U S political, um, system, just having a, a sort of psychotic episode, um, is, I don't think they're discussed properly either. If Ukraine loses, not only will it be a catastrophe for them, but first of all, the, the, the Western credibility in deterrence terms will be completely destroyed um, because we'll have shown that we just didn't care enough to take it seriously, even when we weren't being asked to do the fighting. Um, the Russians will have a significantly expanded army compared to what they had before the invasion. Um, yeah, their production and mobilization is, is, is just going in that direction regardless. But they would then be hugely emboldened. Europe would be facing uh, a wave of millions of refugees from Ukraine, traumatized, extremely bitter. Um, many of them on that experience. You know, if you look at what happened to Europe's politics with a wave of about two million refugees from Syria, um, people haven't thought through what this would do. Um, even if you strip out the, the moral side of it, of abandoning people desperately trying to defend themselves who we pledged to support um, for as long as it took, um, whatever that message means. Um, and in any case, Russia is going to be a threat longer term. 
And that will suck in US commitments either way, because Europe is the US's key market for most of its manufactured goods um, and a lot of its services, and they're completely interlinked. Um, so, you know, either way, this is going to affect the US. And as I said, it, it affects the deterrence uh, envelope in, in, in the Indo-Pacific. So even for those who argue that on the basis of real politics, well, we should just do some sort of deal and it's all got too expensive and whatever, A, the Russians will not offer a significant deal. They think they're going to win. So if you look at what the Russians are offering, the terms, it's essentially a surrender request, but the terms are essentially that Ukraine gives up all of the four oblasts, um, not just the two that are majority occupied, but all of the four oblasts that Russia has claimed is now are now part of Russia, even though they don't control the vast bulk of two of them and not all of the other two. And so Kherson, Zaporizhia, uh, Donetsk, and Lahansk, um, and Odessa is sometimes choked in there, um, potentially Kharkiv as well, so Ukraine's second and third largest cities. But also to then say that Ukraine must promise to never join NATO, but it can join the EU. That's the kind of fig leaf. And Ukraine must maintain a leader who is friendly to Russia. Now, that latter bit is incompatible with democracy because no Russia-friendly leader will ever be elected in Ukraine again. Um, and if one were put it in place and there was democracy, they would be voted out immediately. So one of the requirements for joining the EU is that you're a functioning democracy. So the Russian terms in themselves are mutually incompatible. Um, it's, it's just a device to give ammunition to people making bad faith arguments and useful idiots um, in the West to continue to try and undermine that support. The Russians are not interested in a meaningful ceasefire. Um, they're interested in Ukrainian surrender. And if they get a ceasefire, they will just come slamming back in on their own timetable, having extracted all of those concessions and broken the trust that remains between Ukraine and the West. Um, so there isn't a way out of this um, that isn't disastrous, except to start taking it seriously and to do so really urgently. We need to spend a hell of a lot more money on urgently upgrading our defence production and getting Ukrainians as much as we can and rebuilding our own stockpiles to enable us to go deeper in, the, in terms of giving away what we haven't yet already in, in the meantime. Accepting that, that even the best case is the Ukrainians hold for the, the rest of 2024. The Russians are going to have a large offensive in the summer, almost certainly. Um, and then get the Ukrainians into a shape where they can go back on the offensive in 2025, hopefully against the more exhausted Russia. Um, but that's the best case. Um, the alternatives are really, really dark indeed. Um, and that goes doubly for the US because only the US can actually salvage the situation in the immediate term. Now, at the risk of getting into territory that should probably be covered in a Ukraine war two years on update, I think there's potentially a lot of value in that relatively somber closing big picture evaluation. The air war in Ukraine and the war in Ukraine in general has been a highly attritional, material intensive conflict, one where munitions, materiel, and manpower are consumed at significant scale and where time and time again, we've arguably seen a strong correlation between the rate of resupply and the effects achieved on the battlefield. In the air war, time and time again, Ukraine has demonstrated an ability to be creative with the equipment it is supplied with. The fact that a handful of very mobile, very aggressively utilised Patriot launchers are able to give a significant part of the VKS in Ukraine pause, for example, is a great illustration of the power of that potential creativity. And in battles like Avdivka, the Ukrainians have demonstrated that they are capable of fighting hard defensive battles that inflict, as far as we can assess, massively disproportionate materiel losses on their Russian opponent. But Avdivka may also arguably demonstrate that if one side has massively asymmetric resources and is willing to sacrifice those resources to achieve an incremental gain, then the hard attritional math eventually plays out. And so I think there's a good argument to suggest that the way the air war evolves in 2024 is currently being decided not just in the air of Ukraine, but in the skies of places like Romania, where Ukrainian pilots are converting over to their new F-16 platform, and also in the halls of power in Washington, D.C., where the outcome of the present debates may help determine what those Ukrainian pilots have to fight with once they head back to the battlefield. The situation still seems to be balanced enough that a full range of outcomes are very much on the table. But again, that's a potential thread we can pick up in the future. So with that, I close the interview. Very good. Well, look, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bronk, for your time today. Okay.
and a brief channel update to close out on hopefully the last episode in a while that I'll be recording on the go. But thankfully, in the end, the internet connectivity held up and I was able to make this episode happen. There's a relatively small list of people that patrons and others have repeatedly requested I bring on for interviews, and Professor Bronk has long been on that shortlist. And so I do want to thank Justin for agreeing to appear and giving his assessment. Obviously, his views are very much his own, but I hope that like other guests we've had on the channel, that you did find some value in his opinions and assessments. Next week, it'll be back to hearing from me again, and it's at that point I promise I'll finally include my reflection on the growth the channel has seen. For the moment, however, thank you for your continued support and engagement. I hope you enjoyed the episode, and I'll see you all again next week.